Hello and welcome to Bio's Exam Prep IS. As part of a comprehensive news analysis, today we'll be discussing six to seven important articles out of the Hindu newspaper itself. But before we begin, a very very important announcement for you. Good morning to all of you. That we are having our scholarship test on 18th June 2023 at 11 a.m. You can get up to 90% scholarship itself, and further, you can always see your strengths and weaknesses. It gives you a proper analysis of how, where are you very strong, where are you weak. So, therefore, it's a very good opportunity to test your preparation generally, also, and also be part of our family. With this, we look at the six topics we discuss, or rather five. One is basically split into two. The first is the finance commission, and we'll be. Seeing what are the challenges which the finance commission has. Second is the concept of gendered medicine, quite a new one, and thereafter the integrated child development scheme. How can we improve it? After two very small articles related to first, how do we consume our news, and the bullet train and a major hurdle being crossed in that regard. So these five topics generally deal with from GS paper two to GS paper three, and our main understanding for the first three is going to be mains and prelims both, and in the prelims by section we will move to more prelims oriented understanding. So with this, let's try to understand the first topic itself, which is the next finance commission will have a tough task. Now this has been written by a former RBI governor, therefore it is quite credible. And gives you a very unique perspective on the finance commission and generally the task which is ahead once the Article 280 of the Constitution is invoked. Now, first, let's try to understand what does the finance commission do. The finance commission, as constituted under the Article 280 of the Constitution, once the president will constitute it, it has two very basic tasks: that out of the divisibility pool of all taxes which have been collected by the centre. There will be what is called vertical and horizontal devolution. What do you mean by vertical? Vertical means center to state, and this is called vertical devolution of divisibility pool of taxes. On the other hand, you have state state. How much each state will get is basically called horizontal. So this is horizontal devolution. This is vertical devolution. Now the article again. I'm I'm going to give you the basic understanding of the article first, and then we'll go into the nitty gritty itself. The fact is that the author, the RBI, the former RBI governor, is saying that when it comes to vertical devolution, there's not a lot of room. So it stands at 41 percent share for the state itself. It was reduced by one percent because of the Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh UT being under the center now. So now the point was that he's saying that this. Is not going to change too much. The 41 percent is going to remain the same in that regard. However, the most contagious issue is going to be on horizontal. So, what he's arguing is that how the money is going to be divided amongst the states, state state, is very very significant. It is not the vertical which is going to be problem, though there's a tendency which he points out is problematic, which we'll talk about. But it is the horizontal devolution, how states get their money. Once the divisibility pool out of this 41 percent, how much each state will get is very very problematic. So he identifies basically three major issues with regards to how horizontal will become quite debated, quite problematic in the long run. So the first thing which he says that will become a major issue when it comes to horizontal is that the issue of demography. Or what we call as population is going to be a major issue when the finance commission is going to be constituted. Why? Because last time it was said that the 2011 census data should be used to decide the divisibility pool, and there is a major fear in the states which have performed quite well in what are called fertility management or the controlling their population itself. That they are being penalized for the for being the best performing states when it comes to demography. So India had to bring out down its fertility rate. Its population was going too quickly, and therefore, since the uh, 90s itself, we are trying to push for lowering the fertility rate and slowing down the birth rate itself. Certain states, specifically the southern states, have done quite well, and now they are saying that if we are going to use very close 2011 
and very very new data then our population is going to be less and their population is going to be higher therefore we are being penalized for performing better on reproduction and fertility this is the first major concern which is going to come to the finance commission though last time they tackled it well in the sense that whoever had done better in the demography index got more money however the more it becomes a standard procedure there's a chance that that basic principle could be abandoned so last time it was a good principle that the demographic performance it was called if you perform better on your demography you get more money now the second thing which he points out and this is important for you itself is called the revenue deficit grant this means see even after sending certain amount of money under devolution even after horizontal devolution if a state has current account deficit with regards to very big revenue deficit revenue deficit means revenue expenditure which is consumptive which does not create any assets and is very standard with regards to every state there will be salaries there will be pensions there will be certain amount of interest which every state has to pay therefore revenue deficit is part and parcel of state budgeting and there's a revenue deficit grant which will be given to states who still have a deficit after the devolution has happened this is a standard procedure however this has now created a precedence that why should I, as i as a state or why should a state actually look for further sources of what we call as revenue receipt when it is getting a grant from the finance commission itself so this has created the third issue which is that is this grant actually needed if it is needed then is it because the state does not have the capacity to meet this revenue deficit or is it because they don't want to so it is about choice that is this grant actually making the budgeting of the state problematic or lethargic so therefore three issues he is pointing out first demography second revenue deficit grant which is given and then the choice of how the states are actually responding to this revenue deficit grant Cert certain states are trying to perform better certain states are not trying only and therefore these three issues are going to be problematic in horizontal this is the first thing which he points out he says as it is after 1991 there was no basic leverage for the state to do anything and after the planning commission being gone grants are also not given as often as it was given therefore the finance commission remains the only fiscal institution which or the most important institution which can go for fiscal division and fiscal determinism and therefore the three issues which he points out are this very simply i am explaining to you the concept thereafter the second major thing which he points out is this very dangerous tendency this is the first major issue which is in horizontal and the second and the most dangerous tendency which is cess and surcharge there was a research paper or a white paper which was published from the tamil nadu government which said that the cess and surcharge as part of the revenue receipt or the receipt of the central government itself had gone from 10% to close to 20% doubled in the past decade or so and because cess and surcharge is levied by the state by the central government and does not go under the divisibility pool basically the center is not pushing for more taxes because out of that taxes 41% would have to go to the states is rather going for more and more cesses and surcharges which can be levied and cannot be put into divisibility pool therefore 100% is of the center and therefore the finance commission needs to put in certain type of safeguards and concepts wherein cesser and surcharges cannot be the sole way of bypassing the finance commission bypassing the divisibility pool itself so the cesser and surcharge issue is the second issue which he points out 
देयर आफ्टर ही ऑल्सो पॉइंट आउट दैट वेन वी टॉक अबाउट फ्री बीज फ्री बीज मीनिंग दैट देर आर सर्टन स्कीम्स विद विच एवरी गवर्नमेंट इज कमिंग टू पावर इन सर्टन एरियाज बी एंड एवरी गवर्नमेंट बी एंड एनी एंड ऑल पोलिटिकल पार्टीज आर डूइंग इट बी डी बीजेपी बी डी कांग्रेस एनी रीजनल पार्टी यू विल गेट इट यू विल डू गिव यू दिस फॉर फ्री वी विल गिव यू दिस फॉर फ्री दिस फॉर दैट फॉर फ्री एंड नाउ दैट क्रिएट्स क्रिएट्स फिजिकल डेफिसिट सो हाउ आर दे मैनेजिंग दैट फिजिकल डेफिसिट how are they budgeting that fiscal deficit is equally problematic so now we need to stop that freebie culture also so three basic things is what the basic article is talking about because rbi former rbi governor very very interesting first and i am repeating myself then i'll go into the nitty gritty of the article first is that he said that vertical devolution there's no real space thereafter horizontal devolution is where the infighting is going to happen over three basic issues first demography demographic indications demographic performance has become a major contentious issue and it will be an issue very soon when it comes to the finance commission thereafter the revenue deficit grant where in the finance commission gives you a grant if you still have revenue deficit even even after doing devolution however that creates the concept of choice that is the state not trying to generate revenue receipt or it is just does not want to it's a lethargy or bad governance in that regard thereafter it is also talking about cess and surcharge that how cess and surcharges have now become a major component of the what we call as receipt of the government itself central government specifically and because it is not part of the divisibility pool the center is misusing it and therefore taxes which should have been levied are not being levied cesses and surcharges have been added to the existing taxes freebie culture is also problematic that is what they technically talking about so let's try to go into the smaller details till this point everybody is with me no issues vertical horizontal devolution three basic top points and two basic concepts clear yes okay now the finance commission will be very soon appointed in the next few months to determine the central tax revenue how it should be divided amongst the state and center vertical and how it should be divided amongst the states itself horizontal now the core issue which he points out is that before the 1991 major reforms in, in that regard finance commission recommendations were not that critical because the planning commission played a very important role and PSUs, their investment, their what we call as dividend plays a very important role. However, post reform 1991, as it is since 2014, planning commission does not exist. Niti Aayog is there, so the grant concept has gone away. Further, PSUs have been disinvested in that regard. That there are no real revenue which is coming from PSU disin uh, disinvestment that has been used by the centre itself. And over and above that, the dividends are not quite big. So therefore. the finance commission remains virtually the sole architect of india's fiscal federalism that is the basic point horizontal and vertical is very very important now he says very simply currently the center gives away 41% of the tax pool to the states and he believes that the states will ask for more however with center's expenditure with borrowing limits and the constraints which are on the center itself the vertical devolution will not change quite a lot so it will be rather the horizontal distribution formula which is going to be contagious and there will be debate over it now he points out three basic points first is that when it was appointed in 2017 it took into consideration the 2011 census population figures and the states at that point of time also objected and this time they will again object is that the states which have done well in stabilizing growth rates when it comes to population typically the southern states itself are against this base year that the base year should not be 2011 it should be the old 1971 thereafter they are saying that we are being penalized penalty for good performance on demography therefore this is going to be the first issue which the finance commission has to steer thereafter second it is saying the revenue deficit grant is going to be the second issue wherein the concept is that even after tax devolution if the state remains in deficit on current account it means that there is a need for revenue deficit grant and the simple point of the matter is it is based on the principle that every state should be able to provide minimum level of services irrespective of how it is performing on its gdp the point is 
that this creates a very very bad incentive that should the finance commission actually compensate for good not good fiscal governance so historically the finance commission has always struggled to determine that is it a choice is it actually fiscal incapacity or is it fiscal irresponsibility these are two very very important words which come into vogue which is fiscal irresponsibility and fiscal incapacity a state cannot meet its uh, basic revenue deficit because of its gdp may be incapacity the state has the capacity but it can't that is fiscal irresponsibility and therefore they have to tweak the formula in such a way that states without penalizing the states the states which are not performing well may be having incapacity are not penalizing the states which are basically very fiscally irresponsible so therefore it is an impossible task generally wherein you have to make sure that the formula is such that the states which are actually trying to make up because of their fiscal incapacity are not penalized because of fiscal irresponsibility and therefore the net result is every horizontal distribution formula has been criticized every time so the simple point is the first point he is talking about is horizontal distribution horizontal distribution the problematic aspect is very simply related to fiscal responsibility revenue deficit grant and the concept of demography on the other hand the second issue which the author is talking about is related to cess and surcharge cess and surcharge very simply are added over and above the taxes and therefore it does not become part of the divisibility pool so a white paper which was issued by the tamil nadu government itself between 2011 and 2019 10.4% was the surcharge percentage as part of the revenue itself now it is 20% which is quite a lot doubling within the next within the past 10 years and very simply when the center raises a tax it has to give 41% to the state but when it raises a surcharge or cess it keeps it all and therefore the finance commission has to lay down certain rules and regulations for how cess and surcharge either needs to be divided between the center and state or the center should have certain capping that it cannot and the last point which it makes is that the freebie culture needs to stop because it is only destabilizing the fiscal what we call as health of the state and of the center both so before we move on to the second topic the very interesting article visa we identifying three to four very simple concepts first is vertical and horizontal devolution that is basic static finance commission thereafter the issue in horizontal being demography which is population then related to the concept of what we call as revenue deficit grant and after revenue deficit that it talks about fiscal irresponsibility a very important word which has been introduced thereafter it talks about cess and surcharge being a larger issue between the center and state when it comes to vertical so one issue in vertical three issues in horizontal is this clear if it is clear then we move on to the next topic interesting but remember the basic terminologies which have been introduced in this article yes okay perfect so now we move to a very interesting article which talks about how male centric medicine is affecting women's health now let me give you a basic overview of what this article is talking about what the author is talking about is that because there is research there are then clinical trials clinical trials and then a medicine is introduced medicine is introduced and the example is of a generic medicine for example painkillers or other standard medicine so it says that a medicine first there is research then there is clinical trial then medicine is introduced but what the author is talking about is that very simply at the research level and at the clinical level the male clinical trial 
the percentage is more than women and therefore there is a male centric perspective over medicine if a drug works or not the question is does it work more effectively on males or does it work equally effectively on females the simple aspect is that because men are more and the women are less in the clinical trials there is a skewed understanding of medicine itself so the first point which this article is talking about is that at the research level and at the clinical trial level because women are outnumbered by men the effectiveness of that drug or that generic drug is very simply more oriented towards males or men and more than that it is based on a data set which is male dominated therefore either women are being underdosed or overdosed because both the male and female body is different so in certain medicines for example sleeping pills they are getting overdosed because they don't need that much of a dose which a man needs on the other hand in certain cases painkillers they are being underdosed because they need more so what it says is that medicine needs to be gendered in the sense if we are doing research we have to equally make sure that the clinical trials are happening on equal number of men and women Therefore, we understand how that medicine works when it comes to women and men. This is the first very interesting point this article is making that there needs to be a gendered understanding of medicine and therefore either women are overdosed or underdosed according to the way the male responded in the clinical trials. The second thing which it talks about is that in the same way when we talk about depression, when we talk about cardiac health, when we talk about basic well-being, again there is a male-centric approach. It is believed that women are more prone to depression, but because the percentage of men do not suffer from depression as part of the population, so we tend to see that depression is not a problematic aspect, and rather women are prone to it. There is a stereotype which has been pushed in for women, which is technically not true, but it is basically biological, it is related to the physiology. Second is for example cardiac health. Cardiac health also all trials have been done on men but that is not true for a woman. Therefore there needs to be again a little bit of equality in the way we do clinical trials. Last but not the least is when it comes to mensural health. When it comes to even cancer which is very specific to women, ovarian cancer, breast cancer. Research is very less, funding is extremely less because the men don't get affected by it so women has an apathy towards this issue so when we talk about for example cancer research for a thing which affects both in men and women quite a lot of funding whilst not a lot of funding for something very specific for women so though it's a very interesting article in the way it talks about the bias within medicine towards men which is standard patriarchy for you but the problem is that medicine is something which affects women on the day-to-day -day basis and therefore if we are not pushing this gendered notion into medicine then we are creating a little bit of a mess because women are either underdosed or overdosed overdosing is equally problematic underdosing is equally problematic and their specific issues are actually not getting addressed in that regard the last thing which the article says is that as the president of the G20, India needs to push this into the world forum. India that way is medically quite liberal, be it abortion, we have a lot of rights which a lot of Americans don't even have. So that way India can be the one who creates this precedence and can talk about gendering medicine. A very interesting concept with regards to both GS paper 3, both GS paper 2 and 1, wherein social issues, how patriarchy even affects medicine is discussed here. This is a very interesting way of understanding medicine. Medical sciences is biased and we would have never thought of it in that way. The gendering of medicine is very, very important, can be seen both in the what we call as uh, 
it can be very simply in GS paper 3 also, GS paper 2 also, social issues it is. So let's try to go into the nitty gritty of what she's trying to actually say. So first is that policy intervention is needed when it comes to medicine and gender specific research and therefore India needs to highlight it as the G20 president. Now India is the pharmacy of the world and if there is disparity in clinical trials it is much bigger in India because of the population. So generic drug production and consumption is very male specific and therefore how women's body respond to different generic drugs is problematic. Therefore there is a research which happened in the University of Melbourne which very simply says that nearly one fifth of all medicines or medications showed a difference in the dosage in men and women which means that of all the medicines which are there, generic drugs which are there, one fifth do not respond equally to men and women. Maybe I need to take two pills, woman needs to take only one or I need to take one and she needs to take two. And therefore, one fifth concept is that uh, that's a very sizable number looking at the number of generic medicines which are there. The simple aspect of the matter is that it is dangerous. Therefore, women have either been overdosing, for example, on a sleep medication or not getting enough in case of medications for severe pain. And therefore, they are either overdosed or underdosed, which is problematic. Now, when it comes to treatment and diagnosis, there is again a lot of discrimination because, for example, anxiety and depression is higher in women, less in men, but that has been attributed to a woman rather than understanding the science behind it or having the right medical research about it. On the other hand, depression, cardiac issues, same story. Women have not been tested properly for cardiac issues itself and they are always diagnosed in the same metrics as men. And last but not the least, it is being demonstrated, it has been demonstrated that women are less likely to receive appropriate medication, diagnostic tests or clinical procedure even in developed countries such as Canada and Sweden. Now what is the way forward? The way forward is that we are a country which prioritizes medicine, medicine, medical sciences, health is very important for us and we need to introduce certain policy interventions in which at least there can be a policy that when there is a clinical trial equal number of men and women should be there and that data should be, should be used for a generic medicine. We have an opportunity to talk about this as the G20 president and we should. So before we move on to the next article, this is a very interesting concept. There are three very basic words which you need to understand. First is gendering medicine, then overdose and underdose and underdose and last but not the least the concept that medical sciences need to are biased towards men and we need to change that paradigm the matrix the structure and the trials all need to have equal representation of men and women. I hope this article is clear, very interesting that way and you understand the basic points here. Yes? Okay. So we can now move to the third interesting article which is related to the integrated child development services which is there in India and what they are talking about is how can we improve this system. See in India malnutrition is a problem where a, student, where a ch child does not get the right nutrients. In India stunting is also a problem. Stunting is that when you don't have a, a correct height for your age. India is also a problem of wasting which is you do not have the right weight to your height. And India also has a problem of iron deficiency and B12 deficiency which is anemia. Now, India needs to do something. And for that, they are trying to talk about how can we make this very important scheme more efficient. And the most important element which they have identified which could change everything is empowering and this is the word which they use is empowering the Anganwadi worker 
basically the grass root level the worker which is responsible for the last basic unit of health is what we need to empower so very simply the scheme targets 0 to 6 years in children pregnant women and lactating mothers it addresses both non formal preschool education and also tries to break malnutrition morbidity which is the uh, tendency to be diseased and mortality which is death on the other hand studies have shown that the more intervention which goes into nutrition education health the better we have human capital as it is we have a very important demographic dividend now the simple point of the matter is how do we fortify and how do we strengthen it that is through empowering the anganwadi worker her role mostly can go from empowering through modern technology like smartphones and application to even delivering health education managing feeding programs and even acting as auxiliary nurses or midwives and even acting as healthcare professionals so the anganwadi worker basically is the face of the healthcare system of india in front of the grassroots village population and she can be make or break for the whole system itself so rather than pushing more and more money at the top this is a bottom up approach wherein you are pushing or trying to push anganwadi workers and if you do that the article points out that there are five very basic benefits if we push for anganwadi workers so by adding additional the first thing which they say the only thing which the center needs to add very simply is add an additional anganwadi worker in each of the 13,99,661 Anganwadi centers and by doing that there are five advantages though the basic point is give one more woman one more person employment in the Anganwadi centers basically employ 13,99,661 persons which is not a very big amount because their salaries are not very big and that could have a transformative concept when it comes to healthcare in India what are the five advantages first better health and educational outcomes in a very unformalized or, or very informal setup itself they can be the make or break for both health and education second children who remain enrolled are are part of the program as it is their rates of or their indicators improve in the sense that there are reduced rates of shunting and severe malnutrition so firstly you get more coverage this is about coverage and second is you have better performance you have better performance third is that if this can be made into a nationwide rollout model or program itself the fact of the matter is that the cost will be quite less to what we will earn out of this program very simply the performance will be or the outcome will be so big that the cost will be extremely low or insignificant in that regard so the expense part we are getting 13 to 21 times the return on this investment further new anganwadi workers can be given responsibility to concentrate basically on preschool and early childhood education basically 0 to 6 and then we can have some, something very specific for 0 to 1 and last but not the least and very obvious one in rural communities it can give women job opportunities and close to 1.3 million women can get government jobs or government what we call as support through this employment so five very simple but very important concepts which are an advantage of adding an Anganwadi worker. So, before we move to the Plims White section, I'll try to summarize the three articles which we've done today. First is the Finance Commission, Horizontal and Vertical Devolution. In Vertical Devolution, the problem is such and such as. In Horizontal Devolution, it is demography, the issue related to the concept of revenue deficit grant, and thereafter, fiscal is responsibility. The second article talks about gendering medicine, how medicine is biased itself. And the third article talks about how we can make the integrated child development scheme better and 
in that the only solution is add one anganwadi worker to the 1.3 million anganwadi centers which are there if we can do that we have five very basic advantages remember these advantages there can be a direct question in that regard the five advantages which we get are we have better coverage we have better performance we have bet the return investment is quite big further we are also able to give employment to women and last but not the least is that there can be concentrated efforts in certain areas clear everybody everybody is totally clear about the first three articles then we talk about films bite two very simple articles straight forward yes okay now something which we already know but now we have data for which is that the reuters institute digital news report of 2023 has pointed out that there has been a sharp decrease in the access to online news while television sees also a decline as news sources are now moving to unfortunately tiktok and other social media platforms now very simply if you look at the data there has been a stark decline in how people are getting their news from formalized sources which is gen journalists and very important news websites so be it the the online be it social media be it tv be it print everywhere there's a decline but the most dangerous thing is that youtube is 56% preferred by people if they want to get their news whatsapp 47% 39% facebook and we know what type of messages are circulated on whatsapp whatsapp university news mostly is incorrect and therefore the simple aspect is that social media platforms cannot be source of news and the most dangerous interesting and worrying trend is that tiktok instagram and snapchat people paid more attention to them for news than actually going to formalized journalist media companies we already know that but in now we have something to prove it people are moving to social media which is dangerous which is extremely dangerous if we get all our news from social media this is global data but it is india as a component or as it is see america and all the we know already america is a major trend people tend to go to alternative sources of news but if it's a, a world trend itself it's a dangerous trend Reuters, as it is, it will do a global survey. The simple aspect is, we knew it. Now we have something to prove it. This is a very straightforward article. We don't have to go into the nitty gritty that there's a decline of this much and that much. It's just about something for your social issues thing, wherein we cannot change our aspects of, and we are not talking about news. For example, the interaction we are having here, people tend to watch random channels. people tend to rather go to more instagram and to the the different aspects of snapchat and tiktok to get their basic so basically basically social media influencers are becoming the new journalists which is quite unfortunate that way so tiktok as it is is banned in india but we have other other alternatives to it simple aspect simple aspect social media is becoming increasingly the people's source of news remember this point because there can be a mains question and generally important for your preparation with regards to this is a worrying trend this is a worrying trend thereafter last very simple a major milestone in the bullet train which is being constructed in the gujarat and the maharashtra state itself so very simply there is was a major issue with regards to how they needed to make a bridge on the purna river because the purna river is linked to the arabian sea itself so there is high tide and low tide in that river so there the 360 meter long bridge has been finally constructed by the national high speed rail corporation limited that te technically 24 bridges which have to be made 20 are to be made in gujarat and four in maharashtra and this is the most important one because the water level used to always rise and fall close to 5 to 6 meters every fortnights therefore the dragging and the foundation was extremely important to be made in such a way that it could manage both the high tide and the low tide and therefore the 
रेकरेंट लो टाइड एंड हाई टाइड विल बी एन इश्यू फॉर दिस होल सेक्टर इट सेल्फ बट दी पूर्णा रिवर दी मोस्ट मोस्ट प्रॉब्लमैटिक बिकॉज ऑफ दी वेरी रेकरेंट एंड वेरी वेरी मेजर वेरिएशन इन दैट रिगार्ड सो बिफोर आई एम गो टू दी मेन क्वेश्चन वट आई वॉन्ट टू डिस्कस विद यू इज वॉट वीव डन टूडे वीव डिस्कस फाइव वेरी स्ट्रेट फॉर्वर्ड एंड सिंपल आर्टिकल्स बट वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग वन दैट दैट वेज वीव डिस्कस दी आर बी आई वन in which we discuss the issue with vertical and horizontal devolution vertical devolution with regards to cessation surcharge and the horizontal one with regards to demographic indicators revenue deficit grant and also the concept related to what we know as fiscal irresponsibility thereafter we move to the concept of medicine very interesting article medicine being biased male oriented therefore women are either being overdosed or underdosed and thereafter we move to how we can actually empower our anganwadi workers to make our integrated child development scheme better thereafter two very simple social media is becoming more and more the source of our news unfortunately that is true and last but not the least purna river bridge has been complete from the bullet train significant because of the challenges which were there in this bridge so with this let's look at the two questions discuss the challenges in front of the next finance commission of india very straight forward but very realistic gs paper 2 question and the way to strengthen child nutrition regime in india is to empower the anganwadi worker this is again gs paper either you can see it in 2 or 1 i hope you will concentrate and you will attempt these questions as it is a lot of you gave the prelims examination if you cleared them congratulations to you if you didn't don't have to lose heart there is a next time and it's a part and parcel of this examination thank you so much i will see you tomorrow with again 6 to 7 important articles out of the indian newspaper remember scholarship test is on 18 june don't miss it thank you take care bye bye